if I wanted to be the world's worst data, if I wanted to be the world's worst, um, most unsuccessful Hinge user or dating app user more generally, what would I have to do? Uh, so I've got your first point, which is about be really inauthentic. Pretend I'm perfect and use fake photos or just portray myself in a way that's Yeah, a lot of like filtered photos with you and sunglasses or hanging out with a lot of friends, one word answers to your prompts, you know, just like everyone or no one or wait for likes to come to you. I think like that, that's the kind of mentality they're trying to get people out of. We want to, we want people to like fill out deeper, pro like that's so much of our work is like helping people select better photos that show more of their personality, help people answer prompts, which are these short questions designed to get you into a conversation and answer them thoughtfully uh, to uh, be really thoughtful with your likes because the more thoughtful you are with your likes, the better our algorithm gets because we actually understand who you like and who you don't like. So don't just like, you know, no, because then we can't, we can't quantity. learn your taste. Right. And we're not going to get closer and closer to the type of person that you like. Okay. Interesting. And what about these, um, these serial daters? Cause I've got some friends that are like those serial daters, literally a hundred dates a year. And I'll sit with them and we'll chat and they'll tell me, oh yeah, I want three dates this week, etc." For those people, I'd love to be able to give, offer them some advice. Thinking of one, one of my friends in particular, who I know was, is going to watch this. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I was one of those people, right? I mean, I was a person who, um, uh, you know, constantly was, I wouldn't necessarily just go on a whole lot of first dates, but I would go on a whole, I'd had a whole lot of two to six week relationships. <laughs> and, um, and then as soon as I would find something quote unquote wrong, or I wouldn't feel good in the relationship, then I was like, well, this doesn't work. Like this is wrong. Cause I think I had such a, I had such a fantasy about what a good relationship looked like. I like my model was totally broken. And I think for so many of us, we're like, we're trying to fit like a model in our head with the rea with the reality that we're trying to like match this reality to like some model in our head about what a good relationship is or should look like. And I think my model was like, you know, it stays sexy and fun every single time we're together. Um, we don't fight. There's never any, you know, there's like, I, I think I just had this like very happily ever after moment in my mind. And so I skipped over and passed over so much because it just didn't fit this like model I had in my head. And I think some of us have models in our head that are exceedingly narrow. They have to be like over six foot and they need to work in this type of job and they need to be like this. And so you go out and you're just looking for some reason to say no, because it doesn't fit your model. And I think the biggest thing is for us to um, like change the model in our head that we're that like of like what we're trying to look for and like widen that aperture a bit and give people more of a chance and like see things through a bit more. People have to, um, people, this height, height thing you mentioned, the six foot thing seems to be a lot of conversation because I think the vast majority of people the vast majority of women, I imagine, would want someone that's more than six foot. Is that correct? Uh, no, I don't. I don't know Am if that's correct? actually true. But people like someone taller than them. Taller than them. Okay. Yeah. Um, six that's, foot. That's just one more. example. I mean, I don't know yeah. about the height, but I think it's just the point is like we have very specific and narrow models, and I think a lot of people who end up in successful relationships say, mm. "This isn't." You know, if I were making a shopping list and like, you know, writing down all my like little features that I'm looking for in a partner, like this person didn't necessarily, that like I would have, I would have missed this person. It's quite idealistic. You know, this idea of just being able to create an app where people slow down and they give more information and they're more vulnerable. It tends to be the case that your ideal scenario for how humans behave isn't actually how they want to behave. Right. <laughs> Especially these days, because we're all, we all believe things should be like quick and easy. Mm -hmm. And it's not quick and easy. You get, you get out what you put in. And so we were always fighting this balance of like what people are willing to do and what they should do, mm -hmm. you know? And, and we were trying to, to, like, we could of course build an app that's just like makes it like what people think that they want, which is like quick and easy and fun, but you have to slow people down, get them to put in a little bit more effort. And it's a real, it's a real balance of, of like, getting people to be vulnerable as much as at least they can tolerate. 
And because the more that they are, the more effective their experience is, the better chance that they have of finding the person. How is that received when you come up with this new vision for Hinge, which is going to be slower, much more meaningful and much more deeper and really based on forming long-term connections? How is that received by people? Uh, I think in theory, it, it was, it was celebrated, right? In theory, I think people are like, yes, the world needs this kind of, yeah. this kind of new thing. Like we definitely want something that's like a little bit less like fast food and more like, you know, a nice nutritious meal when it comes to dating, you know, it was, it was still hard to really get people like, they like it in theory, but then they're like, wait, I have to fill out like three prompts. Like, wait, I don't just swipe on people. I have to like, like something about them. Um, mm. Wait, if I like someone, they're just going to see it. Like, you're just going to tell them I have to add a comment and like say something about them. So it was like a lot to get people's head around who are used to something that was quite different, but it was effective and that's what mattered the most. And you know, the, that was a, it was such a huge mindset and shift for us to stop thinking about user engagement and user retention and all these like classic metrics that, you know, VCs look for when they look at like social media apps and to just think, are we getting people out on more good dates or not? And that's going to be our North star metric. And we'll grow through word of mouth because people are actually going to go on good dates and they're going to tell their friends about it. And so that was our North star. And so we didn't worry so much about like all those engagement metrics and, you know, we didn't, there weren't as many matches and there wasn't as much whatever engagement on the app. It was actually way more efficient and effective at getting people out on good dates. And so we launched this new thing. Our user numbers actually started to decline initially from the old version of the app. And what about money? Yeah. And so right about that time, we're starting to, we've burned through all that cash in order to build this new app and we're starting to run out. And so I went out to start fundraising again and telling the story of like, look at these, like we were way more effective now. People love the product. But on the other hand, we used to have, I don't know, at the time, 400, 500,000 users. And now we're down to like 100,000, 150,000 users. And that's a pretty tough story to tell to venture capitalists. And but you're shrinking. Yeah, we're shrinking, but, <laughs> but we're going to grow because look at how amazing these, and no one re like really bought that story. And I was flying around everywhere, talking to every VC. And I could talk to, you know, at that point, Hinge has gotten popular enough that any VC would like take my meeting and talk to me. But it was just, I probably had 50 or 60 VC meetings and like not a single, not a single yes. But at right on that time, we also started talking to um, Match Group. They saw, they could see what I saw, they saw, wow, this is actually something that's different. It's differentiated and it has real promise. And so when we were down to like, once again, like days of cash, probably like a week or two left of cash, we negotiated a, a deal for like an initial investment from them that would set the stage for them to eventually acquire the company. And between 2016 and 2019, when they acquired the company, what was growth like? Uh, it was slow at first, 2016, 2017. We were kind of still figuring out the, it was a completely new model. And so we were figuring out how to really make that new model work. And we were like, you know, um, tuning it. And around 2018, we felt like, okay, we've really started to like, now people are really starting to love this app. It's starting to really grow through word of mouth. And, and then we started to like pour on marketing money. And at that point it was showing like how much that could accelerate the growth. And that's when Match Group invested. Hinge Labs. Mm -hmm. What is Hinge Labs? I don't believe any other dating apps have something like Hinge Labs. Yeah, and it's all part of this idea that we want to build. Like we're just focused on user effectiveness. And does this actually get people out on good dates? And a huge piece of the, you know, a dating app is is relatively unique. It's not just a piece of technology. It's, you know, what what it's the people that are on there and how they're behaving and the technology. Like that's your experience as a user. It's not just like, we, no matter how good we get at product and product design or whatever, like we have to control for the behaviors of other people and making sure that we have the right people on who are behaving the right way. You know, we can only guide them so much with, um, you know, UX. We also have to like kind of coach people and guide people and teach people how to become better daters. And so Hinge X, or, or sorry, Hinge Labs was developed to sort of study daters who are successful, study daters who are not successful, figure out what are the patterns, what do we see, and how can we help level up everyone to become better and more successful daters. And so Hinge Labs really does you know, deep dive research studies on just what is 
what makes data successful um, and and gives us the fuel to be able to um, build better product or build user guides, things like that. So what makes data successful? Makes dating successful? Yeah, like, you know, I've got friends that seem to be successful at dating and friends that are just those prolific serial daters that go on 100 dates a year and never seem to make any progress. Yeah. And also, are there like categories of daters that you talk about? You must have got like categories, like the serial data that's never going to be successful. They're just doing it for the fun of it. <laughs> yeah. And they're like one hit wonder. We we definitely have different profiles, but we anytime we try to like just put people into discrete categories, it never works because people are complex and they have different, everyone's story is kind of unique. And so it's hard to put people just like into buckets. Um, and there are, I think, some general principles that I've learned and we've learned through Hinge Labs. And, you know, again, you had Logan here mm -hmm. relatively recently. And if, if people are interested, they should definitely go listen to her podcast because with you because it's like a master class in how to become successful in dating. Yeah. But I would say like the more that you are willing to be honest and vulnerable and real, like the quicker you can find those connections and the higher quality connections that you're going to get. I think that's the kind of upshot and the way that we really try to design hinge to help people maximize their success on that front why does that matter at a human level being honest and vulnerable uh i think two reasons one is that you get to an accurate assessment more quickly of someone right like if you're trying to be pretend to be someone you're not or you're just trying to be cool or get a lot of likes or whatever people aren't seeing the real you and they're going to eventually see the real you so the faster that you can just put like, be clear about who you are and what you're looking for and what you want and what's not perfect about you, then I think the faster you're going to find someone who's like, yes, this is the type of person that I want to be with. And you're going to avoid all those people that were attracted to the kind of veneer that you'd put up, but then they get to know the real you and then that's not. And then I'd say the second piece is that it gives people like hooks to grab onto. Like there's just nothing to talk about with someone who's perfect and, invul and invulnerable and invincible. Like, what do you, like, what do you have to say? Like we connect over the, the cracks of, and the little imperfections and that's how we connect and relate to one another. And so you'll form a much better and deeper and quicker bond with someone when you open up like that versus try to impress. If you love the Diary of a CEO brand and you watch this channel, please do me a huge favor become part of the 15% of the viewers on this channel that have hit the subscribe button. It helps us tremendously and the bigger the channel gets, the bigger the guests.